we would like to welcome you to the Strategy Playbook for Exceptional Results session. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Verone. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, it is it's my pleasure to announce or to uh, introduce uh, Ronald Marcos, um, a, uh, a an extraordinary student in in my capstone course, who uh, wrote a strategy playbook that was probably one of the best that I've seen to date. Um, we, the MBA capstone course explores uh, the role of the strategy. Um, and how it helps organizations reach its success. A, a good strategy helps guide an organization, providing it with a clear picture to achieve its goals. And over, over the eight week course, uh, Ron built a strategy playbook for an organization. Uh, through this playbook, he, he understood uh, the, the organization focused on its culture, social and economic climate, and its purpose. Uh, then he examined the opportunities and readiness for the organization, focusing on its health, its need for the readiness for change, and lastly, a focus on development, validation, and an implementation of, it, of its strategy uh, and his su suggest, suggestions. Uh, the strategy playbook for extraordinary results represents what can be thought of as a due diligence analysis. This is where one is stepping into the role of either a consultant to senior leadership uh, position or as a member of that team and, and where they are preparing a forward-looking, crisp and impactful analysis uh, about where they think that company ought to be going over the next uh, five years. So uh, again, Ron excelled in the class, um, great student, great person, um, he's going to be presenting in the eyes of a, uh, of, of a financial uh, project management, financial industry um, lens. So with that, I, I turn it over to Ron. Great. Thank you, Ron, for the kind words. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, just to let you know, I have been in the financial and management consulting industry for just over 20 years. Uh, and in that time, I did have the opportunity to work in North America and the EMEA regions, and certainly enjoyed my time working uh, on Wall Street uh, for some uh, very large and uh, lucrative banks. Uh, now, during this time on Wall Street, though, I will say that I've seen some significant events, some that you're very familiar with during that time period, uh, the peak of the housing bubble, uh, which eventually led to the greatest financial market collapse in 2008. Uh, the protests for Occupy Wall Street, uh, as well as a number of uh, the numerous scandals that you've probably seen hit the media uh, probably over the last uh, two decades. Uh, but more notably, in, that, uh, in the last two decades, I have noticed or made some really key observations about a majority of the industries that uh, I've had an opportunity to work with. Uh, one of those key things was the greater awareness, attention, or adoption of diversity, uh, inclusion, and equality within a large number of organizations. And, and when I say the growing awareness uh, to the point that um, diversity, equality, inclusion has become more of the forefront uh, for a lot of organizations, to the point that those that don't fall in line uh, essentially get public shame, uh, publicly shamed uh, in the media, which often results in um, lack of uh, customer confidence and potentially detrimental for those uh, firms. Now, the other thing that I've noticed uh, in relation to that is the larger financial institutions, for some reason, uh, seem to fall outside in alignment. Uh, they, they've seemed to gone in a different direction in terms of some, some either bad behavior, suspicious behavior, which uh, kind of made me question as to how are they able to kind of fall out of alignment with so many other industries that are embracing or, or even aggressively uh, taking a stance on diversity. So this essentially may be question about the, the very career that I've chosen to take on uh, and really ask the question, is it possible that these large financial firms are running against a different playbook from everybody else and still thriving? Uh, and then even maybe question even further, can I potentially put a strategic playbook in front of them 
which actually is a win-win on both sides. It actually promotes that level of positive social aspects, diversity, inclusion, equality, and also helps the firm thrive at the same time. So this leads me to the company that I'm gonna be discussing over the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So this is what led me to the uh, to choose the firm Citadel. Now, for those that are unfamiliar with Citadel, uh, this is the firm that I used to work for. I uh, was the head of the project management office or the PMO uh, and uh, for this lucrative hedge fund firm. They are a Chicago or more now a Miami based hedge firm, uh, head fudge firm. The company was founded in 1990 formally got the title of Citadel in 1994. And over the last three decades or about three decades, they've amassed to be one of the biggest hedge fund firms that we've seen in the world. Uh, as of May, 2022, uh, their assets under management was uh, just uh, shortly above uh, $51 billion, uh, placing them in a top tier hedge funds, uh, according to uh, their AUM. The company is also uh, pretty sizable in terms of their number of employees. They're about 4,000 plus uh, spread across 17 global offices. Uh, another key note about uh, Citadel is they've also been recognized on one of the top LinkedIn companies for 2022. Uh, Devin Banajri, uh, editor of uh, business and finance for LinkedIn in 2020, uh, identify that this that annual list that they're on represents where U.S. professionals most want to work and grow their careers. So it's very interesting to see about how they made that list. Some other key attributes about the Citadel firm, uh, you probably recognize uh, Kenneth Griffin, the founder and CEO of Citadel, uh, most influential and popular billionaires in the U.S., uh, Lawrence de, de, de Villiers of CNBC in 2015 noted that uh, Kenneth Griffin was worth about $6.6 billion, uh, placing him seventh on the Forbes list. So he's also not, not only known for his brilliance and competitive nature, but he's also known for his uh, incredible philanthropic causes uh, that he's put forth with a number of the communities that he works in. Uh, however, there are some attributes which... Um, a little, are a little bit on the downside. I, I will say that uh, from what I've uh, read, if you've read it in the media or if you've worked within the firm, you'll notice that they do have a toxic culture. And what I mean by that is there is a level of competitiveness within the firm that uh, that is is distancing them from the levels of collaboration or innovation that they're capable of reaching. Uh, and they're also very unapologetic about that stance. Uh, it's probably by very nature, they're also recognized for being uh, a revolving door in the financial industry. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, so some other attributes about Citadel, uh, they're no stranger to attracting uh, some of the top talent. They, they offer some of the best compensation packages to date, uh, and they've proven time and time again that they can attract the best of the best. The compensation, though, does come at a price. Uh, you need to be willing to work uh, in a very toxic workplace. Uh, if you do work behind the walls of Citadel, you'll also understand some other underlying themes. Um, First of all, you need to rally around those that generate revenue. So if you are a person or a team that delivers the revenue uh, for Citadel, you're first in line, especially when it comes to the bonus uh, performances. Um, you need to follow the chain uh, wholeheartedly. That means there's, there's really only one person that you're reporting to on daily basis, and that's your boss, which makes it a lot easier to streamline the messaging when it's coming from the top and working its way to the bottom. And the last, of course, is to recognize that a complacency really has no place uh, in Citadel. And this is, becomes very obvious when we start talking about the nature of the revolving door around Citadel. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit more on the landscape of the organization. Uh, Citadel is made up of two separate entities. There is the core hedge fund firm, uh, which I described earlier, which they've elevated to the top tier, started in 1994. And then there's the Citadel Securities, which is their global trading enterprise. Uh, this was formed in 2002. Uh, and the Citadel Securities represents a market maker providing liquidity and trade executions for the retail and institutional clients. Uh, this trading arm has about 1,100 staff plus, and they operate in about 50 plus countries. Uh, Citadel Securities, uh, in addition, they've also become one of the most dominant 
uh, trading enterprises, so much that they caught the attention of uh, world regulators as well as politicians for good or for bad reasons. Uh, but the most significant impact has for Citadel Securities has been in the U.S. equities market, whereby they single-handedly replaced traditional stock exchanges uh, in executing orders for retail brokers. But a translation on that, that means they manage 47% 47 of all stocks traded by retail investors. Next slide, please. Uh, the overall environment then, when, when I start to look at it deeper, it kind of perplexed me. I mean, on one hand, uh, they're recognized for attracting the best of the best, and they're a very thriving business. Yet on the other end, they're such an ag aggressive environment that they've seen a lot of talent go through that revolving door that I, I keep mentioning, uh, largely because they're, they have no tolerance for, for individuals that become complacent. So your value is only as good as you are as of that day. So they thrive despite the fact that they have such a toxic nature, which really begs the question, you know, can something be done? Can, can, there, can a playbook be put in place to really help them achieve both wins and a positive environment? You know, before I answer that question, there are a few other things that you should know um, that although the environment is hostile and probably a place that you wouldn't wanna work on a daily basis, ironically, Citadel has defied logic. Um, they still attract more and more career-minded people who in the financial industry uh, and people are willing to jump at the chance to, to have the opportunity to work at Citadel. Uh, I, I believe it must represent the ultimate challenge that if you can survive this environment, you can, you can make it anywhere. So this, this actually prompted me to question even further. Um, can, like I mentioned earlier, can Citadel rise to the top, promote collaboration and innovation at the same time? I do believe that there are, uh, there are ways that we can do it, and I'll show you in just a few moments. Uh, but one way that immediately caught my uh, eye was the fact that they have a newly appointed chief people officer uh, that just joined the firm then, and by leveraging this individual, this person could help transform the organization that we we're hoping to achieve. It will be an upward battle, but uh, with a solid strategy in place, this is possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Citadel publishes positive messaging. They strive to be successful. Their mission statements are all about being the best investment team in the world. They promote core values that, uh, that identify winning, uh, integrity, uh, meritocracy, and they've, they've proven that they're poised to be one of the best firms uh, in the hedge fund industry. Uh, and they also reinforce this message to their external stakeholders. So all in all, I think if you're looking outwards in, this looks like a firm that's solid, that's ready to move forward and ready to rise to the top. Of course, as I keep mentioning, uh, or as I mentioned earlier, though, uh, if you're working behind the walls, it's a, a very different situation in order to meet that, that challenge of rising to the top. You got to win or you leave. Next slide, please. So as we continue to dissect the overall landscape of Citadel, uh, you'll notice that they maintain a divisional organization structure where each division is represented by investment strategies. And I'll explain this a little further. You can see the five boxes on your screen at the near the bottom. Each one of those investment strategies, quantitative strategies, commodities, fixed them, fixed income and equities, uh, each of those verticals is an investment strategy. They have different approaches to the financial markets. For example, uh, global equities, which is the second last box to the right-hand side, uh, they invest heavily in equity-linked securities, uh, whereas commodities uh, on the bottom there uh, invest in opportunities in natural gas, refined products, and even agriculture in North America. So each of these investment strategies, if you can kind of visualize this, there's three layers in each one of those uh, to serve different functions. Uh, and they're commonly known as the front, middle, and back office areas. So front office teams are essentially the layers that do the uh, trading on behalf of the firm. They work directly with the investors and they perform the research and analysis. Your middle office team just below them, they actually support the front office teams that are very less customer interfacing. Whereas the back office team is, is essentially your, your engine room to make sure that these divisions or investment strategies are moving forward. So with this structure that I have in front of you, there is a number of benefits that you realize. 
First of all, each of the division heads can focus solely on their core companies needed to make them thrive. Uh, they can also devote the time and money to improving their own trading platforms, their own systems and their own products. Uh, and decisions made within each of those let's say, verticals or divisions are much easier to cascade downstream. Now, as these each of these boxes, vertical boxes, divisions uh, expand or win, let's put it that way, they can independently scale outside of all whatever's happening in the other boxes. Uh, but if they fail, if, if one of those investment strategies that you see there fails, it doesn't necessarily impact the other investment areas. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we have a better understanding of the kind of the landscape of Citadel and its structure, uh, it's, it's now a good time to look at opportunities that exist within this firm. And one way we can do that is actually by doing what we would call a sweat analysis or uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Now, the results of that SWOT analysis that we did kind of pinpointed a number of things that I'll kind of highlight here. Some of the key strengths that we can take opportunities from uh, is they, they definitely have the talent to succeed, uh, which has made them even attract even more uh, individuals to the firm. They have the fearless leader, Ken Griffin, who has proven time and time again that he has the ability to lead this firm to the top. Uh, and they've also proven that they invest back into the communities that have made them fruitful. I think Ken, Kelly Dolan from Forbes in 2020 uh, highlighted that uh, Ken Griffin actually, uh, according to the philanthropic causes, had donated about 1.3 million, billion, sorry, billion dollars to those uh, communities. Uh, and it continues from there. However, uh, some of the uh, opportunities that we can create from some of the weaknesses that we've seen is, is this constant churn uh, with staff uh, inside of Citadel uh, because of the toxicity, uh, which again is leaving very little opportunity for collaboration or innovation. Next slide, please. So another way that we can explore the opportunities that exist in Citadel is, is really to understand the organization health. And the way that we would do that is we would address three questions as I'll kind of cover here. Um, first question, does Citadel foster working relationships uh, and support constant interaction for staff and communities? So there's two sides of this question. There's no doubt that Ken does excel in front when he's interfacing with the communities. He has a constant interaction with them. He's very supportive of them. And he's very generous in terms of the donations. And that's going with, uh, without saying, especially for like the examples are Chicago public schools as well as the Chicago food banks. Now we're on the flip side. Uh, when we talk about internally, the support staff, supporting the staff, that constant action, that doesn't, it's a far cry from it. It's quite the opposite. Uh, individuals within the environment are actually uh, not building the relationships. They're actually self-sustaining. They're kind of your one person culture. Uh, and they're always asking, what's in it for me? That's really the underlying question with this. So it's a bit of a tug of war as we've seen, you know, the more we focus externally on, on promoting the communities out there, it seems to pull away from our ability to focus on the relationships that we should be building in-house. So overall rating, I would say for that question is fair. Uh, does, second question is, does Citadel support or promote collaboration, diversity, and flexibility? Again, there are a couple of sides to this question. Since we don't have any emphasis on working relationships within the walls of Citadel, it makes it very difficult to achieve any collaboration, uh, and that would be very challenging. However, I will add, that from a flexibility or diversity standpoint, Citadel does stand out there. Uh, and they recognize that talent has no boundaries. So the company does attract a diverse um, uh, amount of individuals uh, with one condition that they must deliver. So some good examples of the diversity uh, within Citadel is on a yearly basis, they have a, a what they would call a data science competition. It's called Citadel Data Open, where they kind of open up a competition to universities around the globe, offering a uh, a $1,000 prize and a chance to work at Citadel if they're able to meet certain challenges within their data science. Uh, it, it's had it's a, a good following thus far, and it is probably a, 
a very nice, uh, subtle way of attracting some of the best talent from across the world uh, and gaining some of the future superstars. So the last question that I have there, oh, I'm sorry, overall rating then, according to question two, is good. Uh, and the last question there, does Citadel promote a healthy life balance, work-life balance, uh, with expectations that are set extremely high? Uh, from my perspective, it's very difficult for a staff to find that work-life balance. You know, as a former employee, uh, I really knew the kind of unwritten demands, and some of those were be responsive to leadership, which essentially meant 24 seven. If there's a problem, you're gonna get called and you're gonna address it right there. Uh, and since you are delivering at all cost, if work conflicts with your personal life, uh, I, think, I, I think you know where I'm going with this, chances are you'll have to put your personal life on hold for the time being. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So at this point, uh, we've explored the social and economic climate. We've examined the org, chart, uh, org structure and uh, kind of dived a little bit into the organization health. So based on this uh, level of information, I was, there's three key actions that I would consider at this point, just before we start building a strategy. First of all, uh, we need to align the proposed changes to the firm's strategies. And what do I mean by that is, if I'm going to propose something of significant nature, I need to make sure that the strategies that are in place are consistent with such changes to make sure that they follow through. Um, for example, if I need leadership to understand that retaining staff is a much better position than letting go staff that we feel they're complacent, I need to kind of sell them on the idea that this is really helping towards the firm strategy by developing their skills. It will help the bottom line and also be a much more cost-effective way of handling uh, staff in the future, as opposed to terminating, giving a package, and then hiring someone even more expensive. So that's, that's one of the key actions I thought to consider. Second was devising a communication plan. And this goes without saying that with the level of people that will need to interface with an influence, having a structured and solid communication strategy is, is of utmost importance. Um, uh, you know, having worked there, I know that there are a number of individuals that would be very difficult to, uh, to influence without really constant communication to them and catering that message to make sure that they're understanding exactly in what direction we're moving. Likewise, for the employees that are not resistant to change, separate communications would also be built to make sure that they understand exactly the big picture as, in, as to what we're hoping to achieve by the time we've, we've completed the, the strategy. So the bottom line really here is that a communication plan in place for the different audiences will help the organization embrace a lot of the proposed changes that we're putting forth. Uh, the third item there that at the top is uh, build a change leadership team. So this is going to be a brand new team formulated specifically for this cause, uh, made up of influential leaders across the firm that will help uh, help the organization kind of overcome that resistance that we anticipate we'll have. So this team will essentially set the momentum. They'll be also responsible for helping with that communication plan and really help in any ongoing roadblocks. Now, i give you an example of how we would leverage the change leadership team. Citadel is an organization that uh, consists of a, a current state of forays. Uh, and the best way I can describe it is the way that uh, Barry Dim from uh, systemsthinker.com described it is uh, change that either have not come to fruition or do not exert a strong influence on the whole organization. So this is an example of where the change leadership uh, team can kind of help with these forays and then build the support needed to drive the change forward. If I use an example of Citadel, there is a group uh, called Commodities who are excellent uh, at actually sustaining collaboration and innovation, despite all that's going on with the organization. So this would be a good opportunity for the change of leadership team to step in, uh, leverage that foray, attract other teams, and hopefully set direction for other teams to follow. So this almost sets the stage for kind of developing that strategy as we're about to get to. But before we get there, one of the areas that we would need to also address is identify whether or not Citadel is ready for a change. And we would also do that through a set of questions that we need to ask. 
One of them is how ready are the Citadel managers for an organizational change? And to the as as far as I know, those closest to Ken Griffin, his, his senior managers, uh, are often unwilling to uh, oppose any decisions that Ken may make. So if he if Ken's adamant about staying with the same culture right now, it's going to be very difficult to move that forward. So there would have to be a significant force behind to, to help win over a lot of the managers in line. The other question, how ready is Citadel for a change? Uh, this is a tough answer uh, question, actually, uh, as the firm is generally content with staying the course and, and largely because they have proven time and time again that regardless of the culture, that they, they, they continue to thrive. Uh, and the last question, how ready are the employees for a change? Uh, I do, from that perspective, well, I do see that they're ready. Um, I think that the fact that they are working in almost a very stressful atmosphere, which in, you know, means that there's going to be high turnover or the possibility of leaving them on their own. Um, I think employees are willing to see a change for the good in terms of setting a positive workplace. All right, next slide, please. So moving on to the process of now developing a strategy, uh, based on the information now, the initial plans had identified two critical work streams. And the first one is really the need to transform Citadel into a positive global work environment. And again, this is to achieve the collaboration and innovation that we've, we've, we've been speaking of since the first slide. Uh, the second work stream that I see as instrumental is dismantling what we would call the one person show culture. Uh, again, a culture where uh, everybody is really serving their own needs and really looking out for their own in, in full contradiction to what we would consider collaboration. Now, as you're about to see in a moment, um, I'm going to kind of leverage five tools that will help me further validate my strategy or better help improve uh, the overall strategy. So of the five tools, you'll see three of them on your screen right now. Uh, the first one is a strat the strategy map. And in the appendix, which I'll show in a couple of slides, um, this actually combines some of the components like perspectives, the objectives that we're hoping to achieve. And it mixes them together to show you the, the many cause and effect relationships based on three central themes that we'll be focusing on as part of the strategy. Uh, portfolio management excellence, which is our ability to elevate the portfolio managers, the people that are making the revenue for the firm. Uh, operational excellence, which are the underlying foundational systems that help support the portfolios who are constantly trying to create the volumes to bring in that money into the firm. And customer preservation, which goes without saying, uh, we want to continue to preserve or retain the customers that have been willing to invest their time and money into uh, the Citadel hedge fund. Uh, the second tool that I have there is uh, what we would call the political, economic, social, cultural, and technological uh, analysis, PEST for short. Now this uh, analysis helps us understand the external threats uh, and opportunities that exist within Citadel. Now the results of, of this analysis pointed out that there are many opportunities in some specific areas. Uh, social, cultural, uh, dependent on potentially areas such as birth rates, uh, demographic trends, and education levels. So those are opportunities we can take advantage of, as well as technological factors such as R&D, supply chains, and even trends in automation. So these are some areas that Citadel can take opportunities in. Some of the threats that we saw as part of the pest analysis, though, was in the economics category. Um, and this is largely dependent on, let's say, trends in the gross domestic product or even the soaring inflation rates that we've been seeing. Uh, the third uh, tool set there is the uh, five forces analysis. And this analysis really helps us understand the overall competitiveness of Citadel within the industry. Uh, the results of this analysis help us understand that you know, with the, the pandemic, post-pandemic, uh, market volatility, that it, it leveled the playing field in the top tier, meaning that uh, if you're a firm that is uh, not capable of sustaining the uh, wild market swings, uh, you may not be in that uh, league much longer. So this also translates to one of the biggest threats, which is 
uh, threat of substitution for Citadel, that if a client is not really valuing what uh, Citadel has to offer, it's very easy for them to move over to a close competitor, especially in these markets. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the fourth uh, tool that we use to validate the strategy, key success factor analysis. So this really helped us uh, determine the focus areas for our teams. And those teams, as I mentioned earlier, front office, middle office, and back office. Uh, it helped us align specific tasks for the direct and indirect teams, especially when we're aligning those tasks to specific in initiatives as part of the strategy. Uh, when we reviewed the overall key success factor analysis, uh, the results of that really identified that workplace culture and customer attention were uh, of utmost importance to the success of Citadel. And the last uh, tool that we used to validate the strategy was the stakeholder analysis. Uh, now we use this to identify, prioritize, um, and understand exactly the stakeholders that we're dealing with uh, in, in greater detail as well as identify specific communications that need to go to the stakeholders. The result of this uh, analysis helped us uncover what groups that we would not normally think of top of mind on a daily basis, such as prime brokers or even the industry regulators. However, we do understand that these are groups though that have very high influence on the success of Citadel. So as we look further into this matrix, we were able to understand that, first of all, communication has to be key for uh, even people of low influence and low interest, uh, and that we have to cater our communications and, and give special touch reporting to what we would consider high influence or high interest groups, such as our C-suite, the investors, and the, and the board of directors. Uh, next slide, please. So even after refining the strategy uh, and building out a formal plan, uh, the two initial phases that I had mentioned earlier still remain. Uh, and the first one, of course, is that transform Citadel into a positive global work environment to achieve collaboration and innovation. And the second uh, still stands, which is dismantle the one person uh, culture. And, and for reference, if that, that term doesn't sound familiar, uh, Ahmed Hendy in 2020 described that as a, a one-person show is characterized by high levels of bureaucracy, uh, difficulty in accepting change, and difficulty in accepting new ideas. And this usually results in a toxic work environment. That's almost a perfect definition for what we're seeing in Citadel today. Now, one of the final steps in building this strategy for Citadel was also recognizing the potential risk that we could run into uh, and try and incorporate some ways that we could mitigate those risks as we're building up the strategy. Some of the most vulnerable ones that we've uh, outlined here is there may be a percentage of staff that may leave. It's possible that the level of change will just be too much to bear. They may leave. There is an inability for a large portion of staff that may not be willing to adapt to some of these changes that we're putting for. So it's, it's definitely a risk there. Uh, resistance from Ken Griffin, that's probably the largest on my list of all because why would you wanna change uh, something, a good wagon that's moving very nicely at this point. Uh, lack of employee feedback. So, you know, even though we'll be leveraging our change leadership team, there is still a potential risk that we're just not gonna get any feedback whatsoever from employees. And then, of course, the last risk that I've noted there is there's, there is a potential that you'll see some reduced levels of competency, competency uh, in the early stages of the strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So at this point, uh, you have a developed strategy. We've validated it with a number of tools. Uh, this means that we're very close to building an implementation plan. Uh, plan to support that strategy. Uh, before we get there, uh, it would be helpful to complement this with some key reporting and metrics. And this will give leadership uh, uh, the ability to kind of gauge whether or not we're making some sufficient progress along the way. So the reporting that uh, I'll, I'll show an example of this uh, in further, further slides uh, is really based on that strategy map that I mentioned earlier and formatted in such a way of, as a balanced scorecard. And this will really give leadership the ability to immediately spot exactly the progress we're made and also potentially help uh, in areas when we're not showing that the health is, is, is good. Next slide, please. 
So one last area that we would need to address before formally building out the full implementation plan is really to ensure that Citadel continues to maintain their good progress in diversity, their good progress in corporate social responsibility. Um, so these are two uh, areas that, that we've I've mentioned uh, over and over that Cal has personally excelled in. So uh, we want to make sure that when we're building this strategy, that it does not contradict to his ongoing efforts to uh, provide his philanthropic causes. Uh, just to let you know, too, some of the some of the most recent examples uh, of this is even though he's taken the firm's headquarters, moving from Chicago to Miami. Uh, he made some sizable donations to about 40 Chicago organizations, uh, amounting to about 130 million, uh, kind of on his way out. And then as he entered into South Florida, uh, he had already put 55 million uh, into Miami organizations as a kind of show of good faith in his, uh, in his uh, travels to Miami and settling in there. Uh, next slide, please. So this takes us to the final stage, uh, building a strategic implementation plan. Now this factors all the information that we've compiled to, to get to this process. We have a strategic framework. We have complemented that with informative reporting. So we have, we have uh, the essential ingredients to now build out or implement that strategy. Uh, bear in mind though, that this implementation plan will also include those first two phases, a lot of the material that we cover so far, to kind of give transparency into how we went from understanding the organization to an actual implementation plan. So the phases, as I mentioned, this will include the discovery phase, which includes, uh, as I mentioned, understanding the Citadel culture, the social and economic uh, culture, the structure, the organization, uh, as well as their readiness for change. Planning phase, which uh, is really the effort in terms of building that solid strategy and then uh, also following that up with an implementation that supports that strategy, which really takes us to the, the final phase, which is we're in implementation mode. We are now executing against that strategy that we put forth. The actual plan that I put in the, the actual capstone document for this, uh, it lays out a plan for for up to three years in duration uh, with about 107 different uh, activities in place, all staying within those consistent themes uh, that I identified in the strategy map, uh, portfolio excellence, management excellence, uh, customer preservation, and uh, operational excellence. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the strategy map and I, I, uh, that I've been mentioning in a number of slides. Uh, as you can see, uh, let me describe that for you. On the left-hand side, you have your four, four different perspectives, uh, financial customer, internal operations, and learning growth. Along the horizontal line, you'll see some central themes uh, in green, yellow, and aqua blue. That represents your uh, portfolio management excellence, customer preservation, as well as operational excellence. And then within each of those verticals for each of those themes, you'll then see the specific key objectives that we're hoping to achieve and the various arrows that depict the cause and effects between those. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we have the supportive, let's say dashboard report, which leverages a lot of the pieces within the strategy map. Um, on the top hand side, you'll see those kind of key financial metrics that we would uh, recurringly or we would on a recurring basis uh, highlight in support of the efforts that we're doing. Uh, and under each of those themes, as you can see, you'll see a, a health indicator for each of the objectives that we put out there. So again, this is, this is an easy way for leadership to look at the report see where we're having some issues um, and, and hopefully give some direction on how we move forward. Uh, last slide, please. So these are some uh, references, again, for some of the comments that, uh, that we've been making through there, uh, highlighting a lot of the, um, especially around uh, Ken Griffin, that you'll notice in a lot of those references. And there you go. So I, I'm hoping that gave a kind of a clear picture of, of how we took a very simple concept of understanding the organization uh, and fully articulating how 
we could potentially uh, bring exceptional results to uh, Citadel through a very uh, calculated st strategy playbook. Thank you very much for your time. Kayla, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you for sharing your presentation with us. We have time for about a, for a couple of questions. Feel free to post your questions and comments for our speaker in the chat. Our first question is, tell us about something you learned throughout the process that surprised you. Sure, I, I think one of the biggest things that I learned is um, the level that you can validate your strategy. I did not realize that there were that many tools that you could potentially leverage uh, to question and re-question your strategy. Typically, I was used to building a strategy and just move forward, not realizing that uh, those uh, the, I had immediate access to something that could help me refine that along the way. So that was probably the most influential part and, uh, of which I use today when I'm uh, building strategies within the firm. Wonderful. Our next question is what is one bit of advice you would give to Walden students who are approaching this stage of their program? I would say uh, always think of, uh, always realize that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there are times I, I would say, especially in my case, when uh, I felt like there were a million things going on that I just wouldn't be able to make it to the end. Uh, and I think with the support of not only the program, the people and the colleagues there, uh, that really pushed me forward and made it much more enjoyable, uh, especially during those times when I really just didn't think I had the ability to make it through this. But uh, again, the support will always be there. Wonderful. It looks like we've answered all of our questions. Once again, we appreciate you sharing your experiences with us today. Do you have any additional remarks for everyone? No, I would just like to uh, thank you, Dr. Verone. Um, very helpful. Thank you. In my last course, <laughs> you're a lifesaver in terms of helping me push through. I think that was uh, definitely a challenge when I finally got to the, but you helped me see the finish line. So I really appreciate your help there. Ron, you're, you're very welcome. And I just want to add, uh, you know, like probably most of us on this call want to know um, the, the sequel to this, uh, if it does work, uh, if you do present this uh, strategy to Citadel and, uh, you know, what, what the outcome is, you know, I'm looking for part two here. When I read your, uh, you know, your playbook the first time, you know, I, it was almost like reading a novel. I, I loved it. So, so I appreciate you putting me through that and, uh, and uh, good on you. And, you know, I, I hope to see you in the DBA program soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will, you know, if there's a sequel, if I ever actually interface with Ken, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll put that to fruition. We'll, we'll realize the benefits of that. So, but thank you. Great. Thanks.